live today with our guest, Mr. John Morris. Um, can we ex can you explain what you do and what you've done in your life? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm in the water business. It might say it's global, but uh, my granddad was big in the water business and I admired him. So I thought I'd follow in his footsteps. So I have actually consulted on water and sanitation issues on five continents around the world and many states in the United States. I've been active in the industry and I, of late, I've represented the city of San Marino on the board of directors of the Metropolitan Water District, the largest water utility in the world. And that they provide the water supply, supplemental water supply for 19 million people, half the population of the state of California in the Southern Coastal Zone. Yeah, so for the uninitiated, um, <clears throat> if you ever want to talk about California's water, which often is a topic of conversation these days, given the circumstances, this is a guy to know. Um, we talked earlier last week at church, and he mentioned that his um, grandfather actually worked at Maholland. Can you tell us about that? <laughs> well, my granddad was uh, the founding general manager of the Pasadena Water Department in 1912. And he knew Pastina was going to need more water than just the wells that the city had. It was, it was created by the merger of three mutual water companies, the North Pasadena Land and Water Company, Pasadena Land and Water Company, and the Lake Vineyard Land and Water Company. But he knew he needed more water. And he knew Mullen Holland had just completed the LA Aqueduct. So he called him up and wanted to chat with him about Pasadena participating in the benefits of the Owens Valley Aqueduct. Mulholland said, fine, this is okay. No, what you have to do is cease to be Pasadena and become part of the city of Los Angeles. That didn't sit very well with my granddad or with the mayor of Pasadena because Pasadena was incorporated in June of 1886 as the first city incorporated in the county after Los Angeles. And they still value their independence today. So did Pasadena eventually get the water from the California aqueduct? That's not, they never got water from the Owens Valley aqueduct, which was the Los Angeles aqueduct. They got, they joined, helped create the Metropolitan Water District in the mid 1920s with the district starting in 1928 with 11 cities being member agencies. They built the, those agencies paid to build the Colorado River Aqueduct. And for the first deliveries coming in 1940, the first, the first actual deliveries of water were to the city of Pasadena at their Sunset Reservoir in June of 1940. So was this from the Colorado River? That's from the Colorado River, yes. I see. Did your granddad ever say anything about how Mulholland was? Do you have any remarks about the man himself? <laughs> Family lore stuff is all I know. He's just, he respected uh, Mulholland as a self-taught engineer and knew and respected what he knew about water. Um, not being a college educated engineer, he didn't know some of the details you need to do with on design. And Mulholland built his second dam on San Francisco, San Francisco Creek to store Owens Valley water south in the areas of reserves for the city of Los Angeles. And then one night in March of uh, 1927, I believe it was, the dam collapsed. He had modified, he had built beyond what he designed. And he had not done investigations for the abutments satisfactorily. So the fault lines? No, it's not a fault line. There's seams of different soil materials. And or you want to anchor into rock. Mulholland didn't dig far enough into the sides to find where the rock was, so he just put it in. Um, Granddad was a rarity in the era. He was a, he was a college educated engineer. He graduated from Stanford in 1911. So, and then after he was general manager at Pasadena Water, he went back to Stanford and became dean of the School of Engineering. And after that, he came back south and was general manager of Los Angeles Water and Power. Mulholland was first, Harvey Van Norman was second, and then Samuel B. Morris was third. Mm. So that's why I have the passion for the business. 
So your granddad was the first in your family to really become a water? Actually worker? not. Hmm. Actually not. His father, B. Samuel Morris, was on the board of directors of the North Pasadena Land and Water Company starting in the mid-1880s. He was a fairly large landowner up in that North Pasadena. So he's the one that got my granddad interested in water. I see. So you should have been in water for a very long time, I guess. <laughs> uh, my sons are fourth generation engineers and fifth generation to be involved with water. I'm very proud of them. So you learned a couple of things about water throughout this long time in your family. Of like, it, What's one thing you guys learned that most people wouldn't? <laughs> Uh, one of the things is, what are the rights to water in California? Do the people have the rights to drill, to take groundwater, to divert a stream and do it? The California Constitution borrowed from the Spanish Constitution in that all of the waters of the state belong to the state for the benefit of all of the peoples of the state. When you get a water right for surface water, it's only a right to divert and, re and use. You don't own the water. You can't sell it to some other person that's not party to that permit. Groundwater is, we were the last state in the nation to have put any kind of statutory controls on groundwater. And that was about five years ago when the state passed what they call SIGMA, the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, because too many farmers were over pumping the basin in the San Joaquin Valley. So now they have a period of time in which they have to reduce their pumping and, and demonstrate that they've got a local entity that can manage the water in the basin so that it will not go dry, so that it will stay fairly stable. So and we don't have to work worry about progress. it. Uh, we still have to worry about it. There's still some of them pumping like mad. There's one uh, producer, you know, Palm Wonderful, the guy that, uh, that has pomegranates and he also has almonds in the South San Joaquin. He pumps so much groundwater that he's using more water than Los Angeles County. One guy. One guy. How big is his operation? It must be uh, a huge... It's tens of thousands of acres. So, and so is this causing the San Joaquin Valley to like, go underground? Well, most of it... Sink? What happens when you overpump a groundwater basin? In certain areas, depending upon the soil matrix, the ground wall will sink. And you can never recover that space because at consolidation, you can't put water back into it. So we're losing storage capacity in Central Valley. We've got parts of the Central Valley that have dropped 40 feet in elevation. They have caused problems. They've dried up wells that the on the edges of the valley that are used by small cities or individuals that have their own wells. Um, they've, in certain parts, they've pumped so much that the California aqueduct is sunk and it's had to be reconstructed in certain areas. So that's... So it's a major issue. It is a major issue. It probably drives the people like you kind of mad <laughs> all the time. It's constant. Well, from my perspective, I, I was disappointed that the state took so long to get into any regulations on groundwater pumping. Hmm. So lobbies took a long time to get through? Farms, farm are, the farmers are major lobbyists in Washington. I mean, Washington and California, and Sacramento. Sacramento. So they do have a fair say. So let's like go over an overview of how old California's water comes to be, where it comes from, and where it goes. So, what's our major source of water in the entire state of California? The Sierras. The Sierras, and actually more in smoke. Sm snowpack than in uh, rainfall. In fact, because that's the way it's better because the largest storage we have in California is the snowpack in the Sierras. And so we needed to accumulate October through April. And then when it, when it starts to melt, then it feeds the rivers. It's actually the Sacramento River flows about one third again of as much as the Colorado River. A lot of people think the Colorado River is a big water, Sacramento is a small one. No, it's the other way around. So how much bigger is Sacramento River compared to the Colorado River? Colorado River currently flows on about an average of 13 million acre feet a year. An acre foot is basically a, a football field of one foot of water, 326,000 gallons. 
But because we deal in big numbers and serve a lot of water, we acre foot is our unit of metric. And the Sacramento River flows about 19,000 acre feet a year. Million, 19 million acre mm -hmm. feet a year on average. So do we- But last this... year, the year before, hardly anything. So the snowpack's been that bad? We had no snow. We had a little bit of snowpack in a, in November last year, and nothing in January, nothing in February. I remember that. Nothing in April and March. The worst three months in recorded history. As a skier, I watched, and there's just no storms that came. Yeah, and it's the Owens Valley is what the L city of Los Angeles relies on. Take a mammoth mountain where you get that yeah. skiing, that's water supply for the city of Los Angeles when it melts. Um, State Water Project pulls off of the Sacramento River system, American River, and the uh, Oroville River. The Oroville River is the primary source for the State Water Project allocation. Well, I remember um, back in 2017 when we had a big water year, mm -hmm. the Owens Dam was almost bursting. We had a problem with the outflow, right? I was not, no, that Oroville Dam. Oroville, yeah. Oroville Dam. Oroville. Yes, they had it. It's, you had an atmospheric river, which is, it's like, it's literally, it carries as much water as, say, Colorado River, it, but it comes overhead in the form of snow and, and, when it hits the Sierras, it's, it starts to let the water out because it rises up, the water clouds cool, and it rains. There was so much flow that it just kind of parked over Lake Oroville. And so several days, it just poured on Lake Oroville. The water was coming up much faster than they could release it. And Lake Oroville has a large, a, a wide emergency spillway on the north side of it, and it's got its normal operational spillway, which is pretty normal. So when they realized they were going to have to use the emergency story, emergency reservoir for the spillway for the first time, and the water started coming over, it started at the bottom of it, it started eroding, eroding the soil and breaking chunks of the, that uh, spillway. So they reverted to the primary spillway. And there brought so much water through there, it caused cavitation in the bottom of the spillway. And that's when the, the base of it started breaking apart. But they still, so they stopped using that and went back to the emergency and then they had more problems there. So they had to just sack, they basically realized they were going to have to, because to, to lose the emergency spillway would, would be much greater of a problem than to lose the main spillway. So they went ahead and just put it back on the main spillway, run it down, let it break up the bottom of it and everything. But uh, that wound up uh, about a billion dollar repair project. I remember seeing the images, it was quite catastrophic. But the dam itself was never in peril. I see, but the oldest spillways had too many issues. Would it have had issues with the dam? Because <sighs> it, the spillways were not, you were not eroding the dam itself or even the foundations for the dam. So again, like I said, the dam itself, 770, 70 feet high, the tallest earth fill dam in the country, earth and rock fill. It was safe. So just a minor cosmetic issue occurred. No, I wouldn't say you got a minor cosmetic. The, you had a major issue with the spillways, but not with the dam. So we're all safe at the end of the day. Yeah. I see. And so how much water do we typically pull off the California's rivers, not the Colorado? And where do we bring that? Is that mainly Northern California getting fed by, say, the Sacramento and the, the American the, River? You, you've got in the in the Central Valley, you've got two primary river river systems. They both flow into the the Delta, the Delta, which is is like a backwards Delta, instead of being wide at the top and then and and small as it enters the the ocean. This is largely reversed because it comes through the uh, Sacramento San Joaquin River into San Francisco Bay. That narrows it down. So there's this big delta behind there with the Sacramento River coming in from the north, then the San Joaquin coming in from the south, and then some others from the east. So, like in the middle of it, there's a large delta area. Mm -hmm. And very few people in California really have been through the delta. It's amazing what it is. It really originally 
back in the 1850s was marshland. And it was just, you know, it was very beautiful. You know, tule lake, lots of elk and tule elk. And then the farmers started uh, realizing the rich soils, the peat soils, they could grow stuff. So they started putting berms and keeping and drying them up. So they had a little farm plot. Um, and a lot of the Delta became that way, particularly during the gold rush eras. But then as they farmed and as they got mechanized equipment working on there, they, they, where you farm, you, you till the peat soil, it'll oxidize and it'll, it'll, it's, it burns off. And then when, if you get mechanized equipment, you're farming and everything, you're compacting the soil. There are, we call them islands in the Delta, a whole bunch of them that are as much as 30 feet below sea level. And they kept keep building up these levees to keep them dry for farming. But protecting farmland, is, it's all difficult to do in the Delta. But it's, uh, vast majority of, there's, there's about a thousand miles of channel in the Delta. Most of them protected, protected by smaller levees built of peat on soil. And, the bigger ones on the rivers are done by the Corps of Engineers. They're engineered them. And they're much steadier. Those are not likely to fail or to flood the islands. But it's, so it's not really a natural system. It was built to divert waters and everything. And then the state water project water flows through that, which while well, you've got the rivers flowing coming down from north and east, you're trying to move the the state project water through without bringing in seawater to it. So it's lots of operational challenge. That's, that's the reasons why the state water project, when it was approved in 1960, included several phases of development, including some way of separating the export water from the, the, the water in the Delta. So they weren't getting impacted by seawater, but uh, that still has never been no second phase of the state or third phase or fourth phase of the state water project, even though approved in 1960, none had been built. So what did they get done then? How this, what exactly the state water project has? So it brings water, it's, I know, it's north to south. North to south, water technically off the Feather River, which is Lake Oroville. And it has 29 agencies that contract with the state for a certain amount of that water. It's called Table A Entitlement. So if they figured with the hydrology with Lake Oroville that they could deliver in a normal year, four million acre feet of water to the north, to Napa County, Sonoma County, uh, South San Francisco Bay area, coastal area, Santa Barbara, um, San Luis Obispo, and then Metropolitan and even up to Coachella and Desert Water Agency in Palm Springs. Those are all in Kern County. Those are all, those are most of the 29 members of the of contractors that contract with the state for state water project. In a, so Metropolitan contracts for about half of that, for about 2 million acre feet a year to provide water for urban Southern California. We never expected that back in the early teens where there were some dry years up there and we got cut back to 20% of our allocation. We think we only get 400,000 acre feet. Fortunately, we have another source, the Colorado River, which we can bring in as much as a, a 1.2 million acre feet. And we have storage, which we built down by Hammond in Diamond Valley Lake. So we were been able to balance things and provide, meet the needs of urban Southern California. However, <clears throat> In 2010, uh, 2020, for the first time ever, the allocation that the state gave to its 29 contractors was 5% of your Table A entitlement. Only 5%. For, for Met, that's not 2 million, but getting 100,000 acre feet for Southern California. Again, we had, we had the ability for the Colorado River Eagle. We never, it was not a true adverse impact, although we asked for people to do conservation. We never had to cut people off. This year, that was last year, 25%, 21. This year, we started off 
we started off with a 0% allocation because of no wet October, November, December up north. <clears throat> so with, this, with the storms we did get in December, we got a 5% allocation. Back to back years. That has tapped our problems. What we, our bigger problem now is because of our plumbing with, within MET, we don't have the pump stations, the capacity of pump stations and the pipelines to get to, say, our part of service area in Ventura County uh, or far west Los Angeles County. And, and so we're, we're unable to meet their basic needs. We, we need them to cut back further. So they're on a 35% cutback or one and one day a week of outdoor watering. Same thing happens in like the San Fernando Valley because they we the only water we can get there, the West San, San, San Fernando Valley is state project water. We can't physically get Colorado River water. Same thing out in Claremont. Same thing out in the Inland Empire. So there's about... Uh, 1.4 million people out of our 19 million people that we have a difficult time getting full service water to. So we're so, still able to have the water physically. It's just in some places we never imagined that the state project wouldn't be able to service that. Exactly. We, we, just the shock was two years, consecutive years of only a 5% allocation. And th th that's what's in anticipated this coming year with another La Nina. So can, what would happen if we have another year of these conditions? We are spending a lot of our efforts, engineering efforts and efforts in particular, we're doing that. We're trying to fix our problems, our conveyance problems, both on the eastern part of our system and on the western part of the system. We've already achieved some things on the eastern part. We've constructed facilities such that our treatment plant out in Riverside the Mill Street plant, which was built and, and only would use state project water from the east branch of the state water project. We now are able to feed it from our Diamond Valley Lake. We back flow so we can get what water we have there so we don't have to use state project water from that part of Riverside County. So that's in place. We're also trying to put in pumping facilities to be able to pump that further up so that we, we can get it further into system to take care of the Ontario area, the Claremont area. And the, so those, those are much further ahead. The, on the west side of the system, to deal with the West San Fernando Valley, with the uh, Cayegas, our agency out in Ventura County, with Los Virginis in far west, the very high-end communities out there. That's going to take us a little longer because we've got to build some major, couple of major pump stations and potentially reinforce a major conduit because we're going to be pumping backwards on it and it's going to be higher pressure. So we have to put another liner in it to be able to handle that. So that's that's a little tougher project. Yeah, so if things continue as they are, next year will be very tight in terms of people having water to use? It will. Another thing, we are working, we're trying to accelerate, and it won't happen next year, it won't happen for the next five years, but hopefully that... We've been planning and jointly with Los Angeles County Sanitation District build, building a water reclamation plant to where we are taking re recycled water and developing it to the potable water quality so that we can put it into the groundwater basins and make the groundwater more reliable. Because there's another case where the one agent, these, this area where we are right now in the, in the San Gabriel Valley is, is the main San Gabriel Basin, which is not, is not, they operate based on recharge, they, artificial recharge. They import water to, to keep the basin up and then use it in the summer. The county does not let them use Colorado River water to recharge the basin because in about, what, 15 years ago, we discovered quagga mussels in the Colorado River. And the county doesn't want those quagga mussels in their spreading basins. And we understand that. Not that it's in the water there, but we understand the fear. So that's why we're, we're trying to work with the regulators on that to allow them in the interim to do because there's no state project water available to recharge it. So that's why they too are on the 35% reduction. So we're also in our area. Yes. Same reduction. Yes. Same reduction. Or it's either the, the agency had the choice of going 35% reduction or one day a week outside. 
outside water. I see. So a lot of people complain about all the like, older farmers getting a ton of water and the cities are forced to cut back. But it's not really the full picture. It's that the cities draw water differently than say the agriculture places. So their flows are more variable. Yeah. <laughs> Egg of the waters in a Cal- normal year in California, 80% goes to agriculture of the no, just back that up a bit. 50% goes to the environment, okay, to keeping the delta fresh, to pushing seawater intrusion out. And 80%, so 80% of the other half goes to agriculture. Of that, 10% goes to industrial purposes. And the last 10% goes to municipal. So 10% of the, of the waters of the state. Yet we are hit more politically by Sacramento urging conservation more on municipal customers, because it's easier to do, than on agriculture. The cities don't collectively do as much lobbying in Sacramento as I, the agriculture does. I see. Whether well, that's really true that way or not, that's kind of a sense. So I just I, saw the I, I think California has done significant improvements in working with agriculture on improving the efficiency of agriculture, such it has kind of enabled them to reduce the amount of water they do per pound of crop they produce. Uh, we as Metropolitan Water District have had partnering programs we've had since you know, back in 1990s with uh, down in the uh, Imperial Valley with the Imperial Irrigation District where we pay them to do conservation programs on agriculture and we in turn take the water that they don't need for agriculture, we put it in our aqueduct and help us supplement us. That's about 100,000 acre feet a year. We have deals in the Palo Verde Valley where we pay farmers up to 35% of the valley to uh, shut down the crops, to fallow their crops and leave that water in the river so it comes down the river and then we take it for our purposes. So that's where we're helping them learn to be more efficient and get to, it helps us to get that conserved water. Mm. So, so how's the Colorado River doing right now? We're hearing lots of stories. Um, Lake Mead, though, Lake Powell, very low. And the, the Bureau of Reclamation has been working very hard this year in particular to control how they operate the two together. They're trying to, they, they released a lot of water from upstream reservoirs from Lake Powell to keep, make sure Powell was kept, and, and kept up so it would still generate power. And they reduced the outflow from Powell down to Hoover. So, or to Lake Mead. The, right now, the lower basin states on the Colorado River, which is Arizona, Nevada, California, and throw in Mexico, um, are on a stage one uh, shortage declaration. They have restricted, but California having the highest rights, priority rights amongst those, we have yet to be cut back. So we're the first in line for any water. That's correct. But we will, when it goes to stage two, and it will next year, California will be impacted as well. And the states, all seven basin states have to work together by 2026 to have new operating rules submitted to the Bureau of Reclamation for their approval as to how do we operate going forward so we don't have the problem that we're in today. It's, it may have to get to everybody, just everybody takes a big hunk, loses a big hunk. Um, let's go back to how did, how did the river get allocated? Well, you, my understanding is, um, back in the day, there used to be more water when it, and there's not many people. Like when we first built the Hoover Dam, we're in a wet period. The wetter period, the, the dam and the Colorado River Aqueduct and Predator, well, the dam was, and the allocations were predicated on 
an average flow of 15 million acre feet in the Colorado River. Now that's little, right now that's thir about 13 million in reality because we're in a drier period. And that's this kind of, right now we're in a severe drought, uh, greatest since 1200 years ago. So they know that from tree rings. So when the 1922 Colorado River Compact was signed, it allocated half of that 15 million acre feet, seven and a half million acre feet to the upper basin states, which are Wyoming, Colorado, uh, Utah, New Mexico. So they got half of that allocated. And then the other half to the lower basin states, California, Nevada, Arizona. Then 1944, Mexico said, wait a minute, we're on the river too. So they gave, gave Mexico 1.5, an allocation of 1.5 million acre feet. Now, did they take that out of the 15 and give everybody else a 10% cut? I said, no. Magically, the river flows 16 and a half million acre feet, where in reality it's 13 and a half. So that's kind of a built in shortage. But because the dams, the two dams, will hold about four years of flow of the Colorado River, the, the, that big so those year to year variances weather don't impact us as much but extended drought really impacts us. And so that's why we're working very closely, the seven basin states with the Bureau of Recognition to find a go forward plan that works for all of us. Now, what's gonna to be tougher in California in particular, because the vast majority of California's allocation on the river is agriculture. California, Okay, within the lower basin state. Arizona has 2.8 million acre feet of allocation. Nevada has 300,000. And Pasadena, California has 4.4 million acre feet, the vast majority of the lower. But of that 4.4, Imperial Irrigation District has 3.1 million acre feet, 75% of it. Okay, that's agriculture. So the other states probably bigger about that, correct? No, that's, it's, that's all within California. California is the only one of the states that further allocates amongst agencies within it. The other states don't. Mm, they just take it all and yeah. distribute it after. Yeah. Uh, so the, there was... Metropolitan agreed to take priority four when they first forms, knowing agriculture was already out there. The, the, the big agencies, the Desert Ag Water Agency, Coachella Valley Water Agency, Imperial Irrigation District, and, and uh, Palo, Verde, Palo Verde Irrigation District, which has the senior rights on the river. Um, they got firm allocations from them. They, got, they all got, excuse me, 3.5 million acre feet of the 4.4 was 3. Well, it's more than that because Met only got 550,000 acre feet mm -hmm. in a firm allocation. And then, but then their second 550,000 acre feet was a, a tier four that after, so if there was a surplus flow on the river, we got first call mm -hmm. after the others got theirs. That no longer exists anymore. So we still, we are the lowest priority. So, um, yet we serve the most people. But negotiating between the agricultural communities in the seven basin states as well as the municipal is going to be tight. It's going to be a, a challenge. It's going to be uh, how can we work it that uh, we get firmer water supply for people? Because it's very, it's very hard to fallow a city. You can fallow a farm. Mm. So how do these meetings typically look like, and what's that one going to look like? Is it <laughs> intense in there, or you guys? I have not been. I have heard. I do know that when they were doing the first agreements, they had that uh, Department of Material. They just what they said in order to get a decision made. They locked, they went to a lodge in Arizona. And they locked everybody in and said, "You're not getting out until you have agreed an agreement. You have a deal." We might need to do that again. I might need to do that again. As as was quoted 
probably incorrectly, of Mark, Mark Twain. Whiskey's for drinking, water's for fighting. Good words. Um, so back to Lake Powell, I've heard this before, that the sand, like the rock there is all sandstone. Mm -hmm. And it absorbs a lot of water. And it's not as good of a storage device as Lake Mead. And so some people say, if it gets really bad, let's let Lake Powell go low first. And it's better off storing in Lake Mead. Is there any validity to that? And would they ever do that? I, I don't think they would. And it's and it's a, it's not a that much of a validity to it. They they've been designed to operate as a system, and that you also understand that they they're big power generations. So we, yeah. but, and that's that's the tougher thing. You have to stay above a minimum pool level in both reservoirs. So the best way to deal with that is to try and find ways to reduce the water use and get back to being able to work within the 13 million acre feet that's nominal. Even if what that took, even if you just said to every every state that's on there, you're cut, you're cut 20%, everybody. So instead of being allocated the 16 and a half, you're being allocated the 13 and a half, okay? Then at least we're living within our means and leave it up to the states to determine how to allocate that. And I would hope that in California that with that urbans would have a little higher rate, but it's that's tough. Don't get that out of the public, I think, because it's we have to work with agriculture. Is Mexico gonna get any in the New Deal? Or are they out of luck? Mexico? Yeah. No, no, no. They're they're basically a full partner on the river now. So they will get some water then. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Um, is the Colorado Delta still dry? Because I've heard that that thing kind of just disappeared. It after did a while. for years. It did for years. And then we did a there were a couple of exercises to repulse flows out of uh, Lake Powell to run a high flow, more of a natural I mean, like a natural cyclic situation coming through the Grand Canyon. So you would modify the sand shoals and everything so like it used to happen all the time. And then we did one. We actually did a sustained flow out of Hoover's to the point that we went all the way down and, and into the Sea of Cortez. And so we do every few years, we do some kind of an exercise. We just did that uh, this last spring. We had flows into the... Uh, See more cortex. Just to test fund, not on a not only consistent basis, but we recognize for the environment and the habitat we need to do that on a regular basis. Mm. So we that may have been thirty thousand acre feet out of the river or something. So not a big flow. Hey, interesting question. Um, what do you think about Hetch Hetchy? This is kind of sacrosanct for all the San Francisco dwellers and environmentalists. Was Hetch Hetchy such a great place to store water that was worth damming up? In the in the day, it was. It, it's a beautiful. It was a beautiful valley, just like a Yosemite Valley, but maybe not as beautiful. So Yosemite was the first national park in the country. Well, John Muir actually preferred Hetch Hetchy in his own account, and John Muir was actually. I'm trying to remember the years. I think. Yes, Yellow, Yosemite predated John Muir because that was in the 1860s, I believe, when it was made the first national park, late 1870s, where it's John Muir. Yellowstone. 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 Yeah. Yellowstone was a national park. Yeah, that's right. But no, Yosemite was, uh, I mean, Yosemite was. But uh, Hetch Hetchy was picked by Clark O'Shaughnessy, who was the chief engineer for San Francisco Water Department. That's why it's called O'Shaughnessy Dam. Uh, at that time, there was not the environmental movement other than John Muir, who even came down here and gave talks here in Arcadia. Mm -hmm. um, that uh, that's so Clark O'Shaughnessy was the Mulholland of, of San Francisco, but he didn't do environment. He didn't have dams break on. And it was a, that was a concrete gravity arch dam, which well, so was San Marino, so was so Mulholland's concrete gravity arch. Um, 
No, I, I have no issues with San Francisco and Chechi. I, I, I don't think it's being realist to say tear down um, Hetchy. I don't think it's being realist to say tear down Lake Powell. Mm. It was good water there, right? There is. It's it's the it's it, it's it's much lower, much lower in salinity than uh, uh, the water that flows through the delta, yeah, or or Colorado River. Colorado River water runs about six hundred milligrams per liter of total dissolved solids or salts. So it's not as nice as the hundred milligrams per liter coming out of Hetch Hetchy, or even fifty. Mm. But did anyone ever think about damming Yosemite? Was that ever on the chopping block? No. No. First of all, you had before the urban demand or agricultural demand was really there, the dams, the valley was already a national park. Oh, I see. And so um, are there any rivers left in California that have any like noticeable flow like that would, you know, Show up on a chart. There are undammed. Are there any virgin rivers left in the state? There, there are. Uh, there are several up on the north coast, the Russian River North, and Jerry Brown, when he was in his first term as governor back in the seventies, he dedicated. Even though they were the, they were a further phase. The state water project approved in nineteen sixty was based on phases of development at, to be developed as needed. By the population of, in the water need in California. Further diversions off of Northern California rivers were part of that in the project plan. Yet Jerry Brown, in the early 70s, being the environmentalist, declared them all free rivers. So basically, took them off the plate. You can't use them. And all the way, Klamath down to the Russian. Mm. So, so that took that made it more difficult for the state to meet its ultimate obligation of four million acre feet. So, so what ultimately didn't get built? Uh, other dams, uh, a isolated facility to get water, a way of getting water across the delta with not, without impacting the delta, because all the water of the project starts north of the delta. That's it's got, I like this analogy. California is like water in California is like a bald headed man with a full beard. It's not a problem of production, it's a problem of distribution. Two thirds of the water in the state falls in the northern foot of the state. Two thirds of the dam under the water demand is in Southern California, agriculture and urban. So you, you're mix, 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 mismatched. But so that project was trying to, how do we work that to be able to balance and make the rivers flow further south? That they originally had the peripheral canal, which was defeated in 1983, even though it had been proved in the Burns Porter Act in 1960. Jerry Brown wasn't comfortable with that, so he put it on the, on the ballot and it lost because Northern California voted 90% to 10% against it. And because it's, it's uh, since San Francisco people are born and they're saying they're stealing our water, they're stealing our water. Uh, but in Southern California, only 60% voted yes. Even though we have many more people, it caused it to lose 54, 46. But, but it's, it, in reality, in my book, in the environmental side of it, it was a good thing it did fail. Mm -hmm. Because if we did do the isolated facility around the side of the Delta, Called the peripheral canal, it would have been devastating for the salmon because the way they were going to do that is they were going to, they were going to put outlets along it to replicate the flow from the eastern rivers, which would, would have been down, like the Mokolomni and the Stanislaus, and different, different rivers there. And salmon follow the scent of the river to go up to where they were hatched to reproduce. They wouldn't know where to go. Mm. So it's a good thing they didn't. That's why the alternative people looking at going is doing isolated facilities going through tunnels underneath the delta, which would not have an impact on the environment in the delta. But 
again, you've got you've got the opponents of the Sierra Club and such. Uh, the reason there's a lot more water that go, comes in and surges, like when you get an atmospheric river in the watersheds in the Sierras, but almost all of that ends up going out to the ocean. So if you had the ability to capture the peaks of that, not just take during during that flow yeah. and move it underneath the delta, you're not impacting the environment. You're actually improving your flood risks and you're getting more water through the delta to get to Southern California. So that's what's being looked at again in, in a different mode. It gets, a governor approves it, a new governor comes in and says, no, I don't like that way. Let's spend another half a billion dollars to look at another way. Hmm. So that's what the, the Central Valley storage like project I've seen on a map that was never built was going to be part of? Okay, that, look, that's in, there was in the early 30s, during the Depression, there was a, a state water plan that called for the Central Valley system. That was the original state water project, if you wish. But because of the economy during the Depression, the Bureau of Reclamation took that project over and built it as the Central Valley Project. Uh, so that's a federal project. And that's allocated primarily to agriculture. There are joint facilities of the Central Valley Project and the State Water Project, where they use the same canals at some place. San Luis Reservoir is a dual facility. It's owned by both the state and the federal government, as an example. I see. So right now we still lack the capability of like capturing peak flows. That's correct. But how would you do that if we were to do that as an engineer? How would you approach this problem? Well, I can explain to you the concepts that are being looked at right now is, is putting some diversion, some intakes right along the side of the Sacramento River that are long. So that, and then the They'll take water in very slowly so they will not entrain or impact uh, any fish, any small fish going into the, and then it would go th through that inlet into a holding pond and then in down into a tunnel to go underneath the delta so it's not interfering with any delta pumping. And where would it end up to be stored? It would end up coming, uh, coming back into this current California aqueduct uh, in about in south of the delta, he, there's a couple of alternatives as to which way to go. Go use the facility we're using right now, or go to another one that are being looked at. Environmental studies are underway right now, and then it goes. It just comes down the rest of the aqueduct south of the delta. But it's just as a way of getting water in during pulse flows, during high flows, getting it under the delta so it's not impacting anything in the delta and it's not taking water that's going to the ocean or water that's or or fish it's it's so if you did this we'd be able to capture a lot more water you believe you we would capture more water in a typical year more than than what we're losing now mm. yeah it it could be significant it's half a million 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 and a half acre feet in a year that's a lot. It's a lot of water. To take it. Well, let's look more locally. Um, okay. How much water does the San Gabriel Mountain Range, San Bernardino Mountain Range really do for us here? Well, I, let me talk first to the San Gabriel Range. Because um, you get higher rainfall in the mountains than you do on the flats. Yeah. If you look at all of the incident rainfall on the San Gabriel Valley, from the mountains down you go and the, and the San Gabriel River, Rio Hondo. They do a better job of capturing water and putting it to beneficial use than any other area in the country that I'm aware of. About 80% of incident rainfall gets put to beneficial use. Mm -hmm. Part of that is just naturally charging, recharging the groundwater basin. There are significant spreading basins downstream the Santa, well, Santa Fe Dam, and then downstream along the San Gabriel River and along the Rio Hondo, where water is spread in to recharge the basin. Recycled water has been spread there since 1962. That we're using reclaimed wastewater for drinking water. Um, 
there's three dams along the San Gabriel River upstream of Azusa. Is that near Mount Baldy? That um, way no. up? If you try to drive up, you know, the it's Highway a, 39, I think? Yeah, that's... Yeah, yeah, over there. Yeah. You go... That's... You got three dams. You got the... Cogswell. Uh, San Gabriel Dam. Both Earthville, Earth and Rockville dams. And the lowest one, which is the oldest one, is Morris Dam. It's a concrete gravity arch, just about what, five miles up the river from from Azusa. It captures. It was built for water supply for Pasadena, mm. and uh, so they, they release the flood flows. They protect the floods by taking it out of the upper, grabbing it in the upper reservoirs. Reduce it, reduce it slowly down to Morris. Morris is like a, a pool that holds it to release. To when you can recharge, when it's not rain, you don't. It's called Morris Dam. Morris Dam. Any relation? Uh, actually, yes. It is named after my grandfather who designed and built it, and my dad worked on it as a student engineer. Well, I just drove up nearby, like, pretty recently, climbing Baden Powell. Mm -hmm. Dam. Interesting. And so that's just like the regulator for the whole system. For for the recharge system, yeah. How much can it hold? Because I saw that like only the first dam was quite filled. The second had some fill. Well, Morris Dam, being designed for water supply, was designed at uh, 34,000 acre feet. And there was a conduit that came down the river and went all the way into Pasadena. And so the other two, um, they're not really for storage? They're, they're, no, they're for flight control. They're to reduce the peaks on the river coming down. Ah, I see. And is the snowpack significant in San Gabriel's? It, not as much as it used to be. Uh, we've had snow here on the ground. I remember it. You remember the last time? I place. remember the last time in, so I grew up in like Pasadena. 1950s? Uh, no, it didn't make that. It was January 12th, 1949. And my mom told us kids that the next time it snows, we won't have to go to school. I'm still waiting. Mm. Before that, did it snow more? Yeah, it, it did. It did. It's It snowed twi twi on January 11th and January 12th, 1949. It snowed the winter of 32-33. It snowed the winter of 16-17. It's about that frequency. So it's pretty rare. Yeah, it's not like every year in the Rockies. Yeah. Your, your, your mountains, I mean, uh, Mount Baldy is 10,000. Mount San Antonio, technically, is a little over 10,000 feet. Mount Baden-Powell is about 9,000 feet. The one next to Mount Burnham. Burnham was a buddy of Powell. He's also my great grand uncle. Mm. So, yeah, and even up like you go, um, where you ski resorts nearby Waterman, that's around mm -hmm. seven, eight thousand feet. Yeah, and and being on the north slopes, it lasts longer because it doesn't get the incidence of sunlight. Well, it's just not as much. Because I hear a lot of like older people they used to talk to me about ski often Waterman. Yeah, it's a prime spot. Yep, and now it hardly opens. Yep. And during COVID, it could have opened, but COVID happened, and it. Oh, well, Big Bear was open. Mm. And so it's higher. It's a, a Big Bear's the, yeah. the lakes at seven thousand feet. Yeah, and like Baldy Ski Resorts, eight thousand, pretty much. Yeah. But so, then how about the San Bernardino Mountains? Where does that water go? Uh, just goes east. Down to the Santa Ana River, it can be, and then or further east, it's on the San Jacinto. The San Jacinto from Mount San Jacinto, some of it goes through Lake Elsinore, and and then ultimately ran back on the Santa Ana River. The greatest in the, in that respect, the greatest flood risk actually today for for urbanized Southern California, this is the Santa Ana River down in Southern in Orange County. So if we get like some big rains, that thing would be. Treasuries? It, it could be. That's why there's been major improvements being done by the Bureau the Corps of Engineers on the Santa Ana system. Mm. So how does San Diego get its needs of water? Because we're pretty south, but we still have some mountains. San Diego, there's no snow. That's correct. There's less but There was a very little bit on the, like Mount Palomar. Yeah, I've seen a little bit you can get there, but yeah. pretty uh, much. 
San Diego during the war borrowed water from, it got metropolitan to extend its aqueduct down into North San Diego County so that they could get water to support the military infrastructure that was needed in, in San Diego to fight the World War II. The, the Department of Interior told San Diego in 1945, look, you've got water rights on the San Gabriel River, on the Colorado River, I think it was 112,000 acre feet. You need, you want to either build your own aqueduct to, to get that, or join the Metropolitan Water District so you can use their aqueduct so that you have a reliable water supply so you can still have the military presence. That was the edict of the federal government. So it was a shotgun wedding why San Diego County Water Authority joined Metropolitan. And they're still griping, still complaining. And suing us. We're in court in San Francisco today. Mm. They want a better deal for San Diego. Well, I heard they built the desalination plant and they're not they, turning it on. Oh, it's been operating since it was completed. It's a, it's a 50 million gallon per day uh, membrane process, reverse osmosis in Carlsbad, right? Adjacent to Encina Power Plant which is now shut down. So the, but they use the intake and the outfall from Encina for the plant. Uh, that project, I remember being in the 90s, where the, the water resource master plan for Carl, Carlsbad Municipal Water District recommended the city look into seawater desalting as part of their, their water future. I wrote that plan. Um, but what I didn't like about it is the Poseidon as the developer. Poseidon is a conglomerate of people that want to make money and they package the planning. This firm will do the planning. This firm will do the engineering. This firm will do the construction. And they did that first in, in, in for a small 20 million gallon a day plant in uh, Tampa Bay, Florida. And even when they're, they're testing the way they're going to do the filters ahead of the, of the reverse of the membranes and somebody comes when they're getting into construction somebody says look I can give you the filters cheaper says, okay we'll do it even though they tested the others when they built it it didn't work the filters they, they, they couldn't keep the filters it was a mess Tampa Tampa fired them then Tampa found out the biggest problems they had and it cost us over 100 million it cost them over 100 million to fix Poseidon's problems three major engineering companies went bankrupt. Companies that have been around for decades, 4,000 man companies, bankrupt because of Poseidon's practice. I do not like Poseidon. They did it for, for their side of the business in California. They made an excellent business plan. Remember when we had the uh, energy deregulation back in the 90s, where all of the, well, I was in brown all, back in the all, re, all the investor owned utilities had to divest themselves of their generation. Ah, uh, okay, because and then and have others take over the generation. They were trying to separate generation from distribution. So all the coastal power plants, which have built in intakes and, and, and outfalls along the coast, ideal for what you want for desal. Poseidon bought lease options for the property at every one of those power plants. So if you're going to do seawater desalting, you had to use Poseidon. That's why it wasn't so popular. They just a couple of weeks ago, this uh, Coastal Commission denied the permit for a similar, another 50 MGD plant in Huntington Beach. Because they didn't have an agency actually contracted with the youth to buy the water. But they were going to just, it wasn't as popular with the community. So because of Poseidon? Because of Poseidon. So it's not any environmental issues? Well, they, they, those were all basically mitigated in their plans. But not necessarily to some people's satisfaction.
Well, you think going forward, we're going to have to have desalination? No, I'm not sure. Because Met MWD and County Sanitation Districts are doing a water recycling plant to do groundwater recharge in, in this basin here, for example, and in the, in the coastal plain. It'll be 150 million gallons per day, three times the capacity of the Carlsbad Desalter at cheaper cost. So, salt water is your last resort. It, it kind of, and financially too, it, it costs San Diego County Water Authority, I think, pays about $2,400 per acre foot for the Carlsbad plant. At the same time, they'd buy water from Met at $1,000 an acre foot. But Met water was too expensive. Hmm. See. Because it didn't belong to them. So, what word we hear a lot these days in water is climate change. What's the overall impact of saying it's going to be on this area? Are we going to get drier like permanently? Do we know? We have conceptual visions of different ways it's going to happen. It is changing. The climate is changing. And it's changing primarily through, through wider variations, more extremes in a given period, and in general, warmer. What that does from us from a water supply issue, it has an impact on the level of the snowpack in the Sierras. That's going to that's gonna happen. That is our largest storage. That's how do we mitigate that? How do we replace that storage that we lose from the snowpack in an environmentally responsible way? The biggest thing we hear, and, and I agree, kind of, let's find ways to get it into the groundwater. But you, it, it comes in gulps, gulps. It comes in big quantities. You can't put it into the groundwater fast. And you can only put it in the groundwater when it's not raining. So that's finding ways around that as to how to cost effectively and temporally effective get that rain now or snow, melt, snow, snow melt into the groundwater as, a, as our best storage to help solve the Central Valley projects, to help solve the overdraft of the San Gabriel Valley. But it's not significant, not a great amount in terms of the total water that falls on California. So we're good with the amount we're getting. Even but it's coming in, it'll be coming in the form of rain in higher bursts and less frequently, but similar quantity over less years. Less snow? Less snow. Mm. So then, um, if you had a shopping list, you were given unlimited budget, and politically there wasn't any issue, what would you choose for satellite to be built in this state that would solve our issues? Uh, the ability to capture water at higher flows and move it around the state with minimal environmental effects, such as going under the delta, that kind of concept. In the de south of the delta, in the San Joaquin Valley, I would look at trying to work with the the eastern part of the valley, right where the hills come down, so maybe you're at an elevation of 500 to 1,000 feet, creating um, spreading basin areas along the basin. Of the, let the, the rivers that are coming down, so let them widen out and maybe start to recharge that San Joaquin Basin. And it's, it's much more on the east side because that's it's the Sierras that cause the rainfall through the orographic or lift. The cooling water than the coastal range. So to, you can capture more of that rain or even melt, snow melt, what, and get it into the groundwater. It'll, and hopefully you still have capacity in the groundwater basin. But that's, that's to me is probably the biggest thing. Years ago, years ago, I, I had an idea that in terms of seawater desalting, this is pre Poseidon. I'd never heard of them, but I just, Again, going back to California's problem of distribution, most of the waters in the north and the needs in the south. What if you built a near coast, you built a pipeline buried on the, on the seafloor 
may be two miles offshore that may be 30 feet in diameter. And every place you have an opportunity from Fort Bragg to San Diego, or even down to Mexico, you build some coastal seawater desalting plants and you put the water in that pipeline and it's a distribution line for anybody along the state to bring in and use the economy of scale. But we did, uh, um, Met did research in the 90s on thermal technology and looking at advancing thermal technology for seawater desalting. Does it use geothermal? No, no, it just, it, it uses heat. It's, it, it's, it, it basically it's boiling water. You boil it at lower pressure. So we're looking at doing a vertical tube evaporator, 30 effects. The water would start hotter up at about 200 degrees at the, at the top. And, and it would condense and keep condensing. You keep lowering the temperature, keep lowering the temperature. So we're actually still be generating water because of lower pressure. Yeah. You generate water at 100 degrees. And you, we can think when we were looking at that, we, and doing the economics evaluations with membranes, reverse osmosis versus what we could do that for. And our calculation showed that if we did something that was 25 million gallons per day, we could compete very readily with the cost of our reverse osmosis at that time. But we were looking at doing the plants at hundreds of millions of gallons per day it would be significantly cheaper than reverse osmosis. But membrane industry has more, more power. So don't mess with our business. So I see like the challenges in the water business or as much the human challenge as the physical challenge of collection and rain. And part of that is conveying a message as to what are the physical challenges and how can we mitigate those to a degree that the public understands what that is, what the implications of it on humanity and the environment. Mm. One more thing, just curiosity. So you know the Salton Sea, right? I do. That formed in one year. Uh, two years. Two years. Two and a half, years. actually two and a half oh. years. Like there's a the, big flood, right? Well, the... The Imperial, they, they, they had a water company down there for the Imperial Valley. And they had created a diversion off of the Colorado River that, that actually came around through Mexico and ended up and came up back up into the Imperial Valley. And then in 1904, I was believe, they had some high flows on the Colorado River and it broke their diversion. And all of a sudden the entire river came flowing through and into the valley and created that, that into the Salton Sink that created the current Salton Sea. Uh, actually, that's a relative unit because te technically that is part of the Colorado River Delta. It's below sea level, 200, over 200 feet below sea level. Historically, on average, the sea would change, I mean, the river would change and go into the sea about once every thousand years. It's just, this is the one that we know because it's when mankind was around to watch it or create it. So that's an interesting phenomenon then. It can naturally happen, but we just forced his hand. It's amazing what we can do. What's it fed by though? Like, how does it stay the Salton Sea and not the Salton Dry Sea? Uh, the biggest issue is agricultural drainage. Oh, so that's why it's so toxic then. The salinity has continued to increase when you look at So you figure when it was first created in 1904, it had a salinity, salinity of uh, 450 milligrams per liter or 500 milligrams per liter. And today it's nearing it's about 55,000. So I think that I'm not sure if they've, I know they've lost the ability for fish to reproduce, but I'm not sure whether there's still any tilapia that are still living in there. You've got brine shrimp and other things. You got, it's a different environment. It's more like, becoming more like the uh, Great Lake, uh, salt, Great Salt Lake. Let's see.
no, there's no natural outlet in each of those water bodies. There's no natural outlet. So it just, and you hear so many things in the media, you hear it in Sacramento, you hear it in Washington, you hear it even here in the Imperial Valley. Save the salt and sea, save the salt and sea, restore the salt and sea. To what do you want to restore it? To what it was before 1904, a dry basin? To what it was after 1904 to 1960, or from, excuse me, the 50s, a beautiful resort, water skiing races on a regular basis? Which, what's your vision of it? Because it's an entirely different solution to get to those, neither one of which is cheap. Can we make it back to like the golden eras of ski racing there? You would have to get, there's an adverse salt balance. The, because the salt, uh, the Colorado River is fairly salty very versus the state water traffic. And agriculture adds salts through its process and such. The, it's got an adverse salt load of 4 million tons a year. How do you get that out? I don't have a solution for you. <laughs> distillation. You're going to have some huge mine the salt. Distillation. It's extremely expensive because it takes a lot of time. Physically, technically, could it be done? Yeah. And maybe there's some value to the salts. Well, they look at one of the other things they're realizing is they've got some salts in the different selenium and, and others down there. And they've got some. Uh, Power plants that operate up geothermal power plants that they're going to take their waste stream and they're going to they can we can create chip factories down there because we get the minerals that you can do your your chips with. They're well, doing some work on that. But that's that's just dealing with the deep groundwater that kind of and, and doing that because it's hot and it's been thermally. Um, it's very expensive to get that out, and is it worth it? I guess that's a lot of questions with the water issues in the state. But looking forward to the future, um, right now, are they doing any like seeding of the clouds in the Sierras to increase? They snowfall? are. Yes, they are, and they're doing seeding in the north in the Sierras. They're doing seeding in the uh, in Utah, in, 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 the, in the northern Rockies. There are measurable quantities of water being generated. But not millions of acre feet. Is there any way we'll be able to like directly influence the weather way out in the, in the future? I guess we have been since we've been planted on the planet. The actions of man have had huge effects on the development of the weather patterns, not necessarily for the good. Well, we'll leave it at that. Thank you for coming on. I really appreciate it. You're very welcome.